Like most Americans who fought in Korea, 19-year-old Ed Reeves of Joliet, Illinois, was a private in the Army. But as he fought his way through the icy mountains of North Korea, he already knew what General MacArthur was just about to discover. Reeves knew that the Chinese communists, or as he called them, the Chai Kongs, had already entered the war in great numbers. What neither MacArthur nor Reeves knew was that absolute disaster was about to strike at a frozen hill called the Chosin Reservoir. The night of the 27th is when they were shooting all around us. They're already on the ridge. I think they were in place before we moved up and dug in. And then from there on, it was just hanging on by our fingernails till morning. Everybody talks about the cold that was there because you tried to find anything to find relief from the cold. Cold actually hurt you more than the wounds when you were wounded. It was like somebody hitting you. It was so hard, you ached from it. Morning of the 28th, an officer called to me. I took two steps toward him, and the enemy dropped a large mortar shell right behind my heels, and I flew. But it was so cold that immediately your blood would start freezing in your clothing, and it would stop up the holes and hold the blood in you. So the cold actually was saving me. Having survived with no food for over a week, with shattered legs, with severe frostbite, and with broken bones, Private Reeves crawled for 24 hours, inching his way across three and a half miles of ice before being rescued by the Marines. In desperate need of immediate medical attention, Ed was flown by helicopter to a Mobile Army Surgical Hospital, a MASH unit, for treatment. When Ed Reeves arrived at the 8076 MASH unit, the doctors could not believe this man was still breathing. Yet somehow, he was alive. This was news he desperately wanted to share with his mother, but his hands could not hold a pen. Dear Mom, this letter is being written by a buddy. The reason this temporary letter is to let you know that I'm all right and not to worry. It seems that they've decided to give me a little rest at long last. It seems that I got a little bit of frostbite in my hands. They're treating me fine, and I'll be using my hands again before I realized I ever even had them frostbitten. Love, Ed. Private Reeves was shipped back to the States for treatment. He lost all of his fingers and both legs below the knees. But with his mother's faith and Ed's determination, he was eventually able to leave the hospital. Hi, Hope. I'm Emily Beltram, one of your ministers here at Hope Ankeny. And I find the story of Ed Reeves' endurance and survival incredibly inspiring. Um, it's left a mark on me from as long as I can remember. I, can't, I actually can't remember the first time I heard it, but I do know that as soon as I learned to read, I, I read this unshackled pamphlet that um, told the story of how Jesus delivered Ed from the Chosen Reservoir when the Chinese overtook the troops there. And it's left an indelible mark on me my whole life. I think um, the Ed Reeves story is why I have such respect for soldiers and why I so deeply loathe war. And it might be why I'm pretty good staying calm in an emergency. And it's also probably a big part of why I stand here on a stage to tell people about Jesus. Because he was my grandpa. And grandpa and granny left a huge impression on me my whole life. Growing up with a grandpa who had no fingers and no feet, like you kind of normalize things in weird ways. So the thing that always impressed us about grandpa was that it felt like he could do everything anybody else could do. He just always had to find a different way, right? So like he could write, he would put a pen between his palms to write. And at breakfast, he would put his spoon in the crease of his palm to eat. And um, he was a computer programmer in the early days of computers. He made a career that way. He walked on wooden legs. 
And he even could use those wooden legs. He drove an unmodified car throughout my childhood. I just remembered him always being able to do anything he needed to. But he would joke that there was one thing that everybody else could do that he missed out on. So he couldn't pick his nose. (laughs) You're stuck with that one. So for the most part, the only time that we ever saw Grandpa in his wheelchair would be if you stayed at Grandpa and Granny's house, he would roll out to breakfast. He liked to eat breakfast before he put his legs on. But he was not helpless even then. Uh, He didn't need foot rest because he didn't have feet. So he could just pop himself right out in front of his chair there, and he could walk on his knees. He was kind of wobbly that way because, you know, he only had a little bit of shin on each leg. But he could come after a grandkid if he needed to. (laughs) And uh, my aunt tells this story about uh, this, this morning when my little sister, she probably had it coming, but Grandpa was after her. He would threaten us with noogies because he was all knuckles. <laughs> so he's coming after her, and she's trying to get away. She's having a hard time getting away. And in 1982, every little girl adored Wonder Woman. So she, light bulb goes off. I know how to handle getting away from Grandpa. She spins like Linda Carter, yells, Wonder Woman, and pushes him over. My grandpa went over like a domino onto the tile floor, and everybody froze. He could be hurt. He might be angry. What was going to happen next? And when they came to help him up, he was down there belly laughing at his audacious granddaughter who had the gall to think she was Wonder Woman. You probably know some people, maybe not exactly like my grandpa, but you probably know people like my grandpa, right? People who somehow, through all kinds of adversity and hardship, they somehow still have this unquenchable joy. I bet some of you are those people, and you know that people will ask, where does this come from? How can you have that kind of joy with what you've been facing? And in the letter to the Philippians from Paul that we are going to be looking at today, He says a lot about that unquenchable joy that you can have. He says in chapter 3, verse 1, Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things. I do it to safeguard your faith. And then you heard today's reading, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Joy, rejoicing, is always inspired by the goodness of God. It is what happens in us when we hear and trust the goodness of God, the promises of faith. And that's why Paul, he doesn't get tired of repeating himself. He will talk about it over and over and over again. He wants everybody to know about Jesus because every time they hear it, it activates their faith and reinvigorates their joy. And I truly believe that is the joy that I witnessed in my grandparents. My grandpa's joy and my granny's joy, it's different from everyday happiness. It's not the same. It's far more durable. I mean, what is everyday happiness? You know what everyday happiness is. It's that feeling that you get when when you eat food, when you see a beautiful sunrise or sunset, when, when you get mail from someone you like instead of junk mail, when someone you love hugs you and you feel loved. The thing about everyday happiness, though, is that it's fleeting it kind of only lasts as long as you have what you want. And let me be clear, that's fine. That's good. That's perfectly normal. In fact, that's how we are designed to be. We are designed to feel happiness when we are getting the things that we want and to feel sad when we have to make do. It's totally normal to have a full range of human emotion, fear and joy, Sorrow, sadness, 
shame, anger. That's what makes you a person. You're made that way. I think that the unhealthy trap that we sometimes fall into is when we start trying to avoid feeling the full range of human emotion. In particular, when we start trying to force happiness into every second of every day, that is not joy. In fact, there's a word for that that is a little uncomfortable for us to hear. When we start thinking that we can be happy all the time, it's sinful. How is that sinful? Well, first, what about when it's not sinful? What about when it's just healthy happiness? Well, there's, that's, that makes sense that you should be happy when you get the things that you need. And those everyday good things, Martin Luther calls them daily bread, right? The daily bread that we pray for. Our shelter, our food, the love of the people around us, the things that bring us joy and happiness in life, that is daily bread. It keeps us going. It nourishes us. And it's really healthy when we stop to recognize that every good thing comes from a God who loves us. Because joy is always inspired by the goodness of God. That leads us to joy. So if happiness leads us to joy, then why would it ever be sinful? Well, that's about who's in control. Who's in control? Because that's the original sin. The original sin is we want it to be us. We want to be in control. And so waiting for God to just give us what we need, that's like way too passive. We can't do that. That seems kind of uncertain. So what do we do? Well, we always do this. We start grabbing for the things that we need. We start striving for the things that make us happy. We start trying to provide for ourselves what only God can give us. And we replace the joy of knowing that we have a good God with a steady supply of everyday happiness. That makes us compete. It makes us strive. And it actually leads us to end every day in fear of what tomorrow might bring. Because if we're depending on ourselves to get us by with enough happiness then we know that we don't have a stable source. We're unreliable. We're unreliable because we are not God. Thinking that we can control our happiness turns those good gifts into little g, gods of their own, what God designed to give us life. We suddenly start having to need more and more and more of it. We don't just fear death. We fear being uncomfortable, especially here in the U.S. So there's never enough. It's a little G God that is merciless, and it will demand you to keep getting more and more and more until you die. And it's easy for us to recognize when this becomes extreme We know that it's sinful when it's addiction. But addiction doesn't start as addiction. No, that's why it's a trap. It hides behind good things. Food, medication, sexuality. Good gifts that God has given us because they nourish and sustain humanity. But when addiction sets in, they become God. We become convinced that we can't live without those things, that our life is meaningless without those things. If joy is inspired by the goodness of God, addiction is the utter opposite of joy. And my grandpa was confronted with that. Uh, When he was, you know, brought to the field hospital and assessed, he was a mess. Nobody was thinking, I wonder if this guy has joy. They were thinking, this guy's never going to have happiness. And even after they flew him back to the U.S., he was in an army hospital that was a long drive from his hometown, but he wanted to talk to his mom. So they gave him a chance to make a phone call, and when he finished talking to his parents, the doctor 
grabbed the phone and went out of the room. And my grandpa had some feelings about that. Take a look at what he said. Colonel put his head in while the nurse was going to put it up. He says, don't hang up. I want to talk to his mother. And so he's around the corner with the phone, but full morphine you can hear a long ways. And he said, uh, Mrs. Reeves, don't come to the hospital. We believe your son's dying now. If he does live, he'll be bed by um, the rest of his life. He's probably already addicted. We're giving him so much, and it still doesn't work. And so he'll be on drugs the rest of his life, bed-bound. His life's over. Even if he lives, stay home. Remember your son how he was. And I was mad all over again. Who's this colonel to say I'm dying? Good Lord brought me that far. I'm not dying. And I was mad. And I let everybody know I was mad. Oh, my grandpa told some funny stories about how he let everyone know he was mad. (laughs) The doctor was looking at grandpa through that worldly lens of happiness. And he saw a quadruple amputee full of shrapnel, said there is no happiness ever to be had for this young man. It's over. Now, You might think that that doctor sounds like a creep. But if you do think that, if that's your gut reaction, pause for a second and think. This was decades before the ADA was going to force us to actually build buildings that wheelchairs could get in and out of. And we are still a very ableist culture. We're ingrained in it. It's not something you do on purpose. When you see someone with limitations, every one of us does a little math in our head about how much value their life has lost because of what they can't do. It's just the world that we live in. And back in 1950, my grandpa, he looked like someone who had no possibility for the everyday happiness that everyone else depends on to get them through each day. And they're kind of right. I mean, when I think about what he went through, if my grandpa had decided to lay on a gurney with a morphine drip and wait for the end to come, he would have been totally justified. He knew Jesus. He had peace about where he was going. That would have made absolute sense. Imagine the difference of what he was going to get in life versus people who have all their fingers, all their feet, and in mind that is untarnished by war. He would have good reason to just give it up. So I personally am incredibly inspired by how angry my grandpa got. And you heard the reason he gave. If God had brought him this far, if God had brought him this far, then whose business was it to say that this was where it was going to end? He knew God's goodness. I don't think his anger was just anger. I think his anger was an expression of his unquenchable joy because he knew that God had delivered him from what he had been through, and that meant that he could trust God to see him through from there. Grandpa's decision to fight for his life or to surrender to the darkness Well, it actually makes me think of one of the many very quotable verses from this letter to the Philippians. In the NLT, chapter 1, verse 21 says, For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. You might be more familiar, I know I was more familiar with the NIV translation. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. It's a very noble-sounding verse. And there are a lot of those kind of verses in this letter to the Philippians. I keep talking about it, so I guess we might as well talk about it a little bit, right? We're, in, we're working through the whole Holy Bible in a year this year. And this, week, this month, we are on this series, God's Electric Power Company, which is a mnemonic device. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Four letters of Paul. And we've been doing a letter a week this month. And because we've been doing that, you might already be starting to think, 
these letters are all kind of blurring together for me. And that makes perfect sense. It happens to me as well. There are so many of them, right? And the, it, it's worth doing a little Bible study. It's worth digging in and getting some context because each of these letters was written, well, they were written to a specific church in a specific place for a specific reason. And not one of them is addressed to the followers of Jesus on the north side of Ankeny, Iowa in 2023. So there are things that we don't just automatically read and understand about what's going on in these letters. It's worth digging in so that we can get so that we can understand them better and learn more from them. But these letters all had some important things in common. For instance, um, they're all written by Paul. So you'll notice that there's similarities in tone and vocabulary and theology, who he says God and Jesus and Holy Spirit are. And, of course, the foundation of all of these letters is the person and gospel of Jesus Christ. It was the foundation of Paul in his life, and it was the foundation of his relationship with those churches. So even though these are not cut-and-paste replica letters of each other, there's still a harmony that you will hear when you hear their collective witness. So our task for today is to learn some things specifically about the letter to the Philippians. So here's a quick rundown. Uh, This is one of four prison letters. These are the letters that Paul wrote while he was incarcerated. And he was actually in jail so often that historians can't agree about which incarceration he was writing from when he wrote this letter. But he says some pretty grim things about death that suggest he was in dire circumstances. This might have even been his last time in prison before he was executed. We also know that Paul had a very friendly relationship with the church in Philippi, which is interesting because the town of Philippi was very hostile to Paul and the gospel. He had been run out of town. We read it in Acts the first time he came to Philippi, but not before he had planted faith with a group of believers. And it happened to be, we know that one of them was Lydia, the seller of purple cloth. So she was wealthy, and there were apparently some other wealthy folks there too who were devoted to the gospel. And so unlike any other church that Paul founded, he would not normally accept support from those churches, but the church in Philippi was generous with him, and he accepted regular gifts from them to support his ministry. So that's actually the occasion for this letter. They sent him help while he was in prison, and he is sending back his letter of thanks and encouragement with the messenger to go back to them. But if all of that is really too much to try and remember, there is one word that sums up Philippians that you should think of every time you hear Paul's letter to the Philippians, and that word is joy. It's wild because this letter that was written by a prisoner to a persecuted church is dripping with unquenchable joy. And the Greek word that's behind Paul's word, the word that we hear, joy, is chara. So just for fun, let's see if you can say it without spitting on each other. Turn to each other and just say chara. Nicely done. So Ashley shared some about this word a couple of weeks ago. And um, so I won't go into great detail, but what I wanted you to notice is I looked back over the New Testament to look for how this word shows up, especially in the Gospels. So here are some places where we see this word and see if you don't notice a pattern. Uh, We find it in Matthew 28, 8. This is right after the women encountered the angel who told them that Jesus was not dead but alive. They were very frightened, but also filled with great chara, joy. Luke 10.20, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. John 15.11, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. What we see is that Joy, chara, it is what happens in believers when they hear 
and trust in God's goodness and grace. It happens over and over here. The goodness of God in the things that Jesus revealed to the disciples, the truth that they got from Jesus filled them with joy. When when we realize the goodness of God has written our names on God's family tree, Chara happens. When God resurrected our Savior, God's goodness inspires joy. It's how it works. So when Paul is writing to the Philippians and he is telling them to have joy, he's not telling them to pretend to be happy. This isn't the false positivity that you'll see on your Instagram feed. It's not the manifesting that earnest TikTokers will encourage you to do, where you just just think about joy and trust that you have joy and believe that you have joy and act like you have joy, and then you'll have joy. No. This joy has a source, and it's not you. And believe it or not, it's also not in and out burger, as much happiness as that does give me. No, this kind of joy is only inspired by the goodness of God. So in our passage today, Paul's reinvigorating their joy by reminding them that God's goodness is far greater than his or their adversity. And he explains, he reminds them why God's goodness can inspire so much joy. First of all, he tells them it's because everything else is temporary. He says in four, five, chapter 4, verse 5, Remember the Lord is coming soon. Whatever brokenness, whatever grief, or sorrow, or pain you're experiencing in this world, it will not last forever. You can take comfort in that. God's goodness is eternal, and we have been invited into it. Our earthly lives are a blip. On the other hand, if you right now are in one of those hard seasons where you're enduring pain or grief or sorrow, well, then you might want to follow up. If our Savior is coming soon, how soon? Because this doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel like just a blip. It's not inconsequential. You might be asking, how much can one person take, Lord? And if you're asking that question, well, one place to start is to think over your own life. What's the worst thing that somehow you've already managed to endure? Chronic pain? Horrible loss? A couple weeks without food and 40 degrees below zero with wounds that are frozen. Those things are not inconsequential that you have gotten through. And I know they weren't inconsequential for my grandpa. His frostbites and his shrapnel, that caused him chronic pain for every day for the rest of his life, which, praise God, was 60 more years. He lived to be 79 years old. When I think about, for myself, what's the hardest thing that I ever had to endure? I think about this one night back early in the pandemic when I got sick. And I had pleurisy and pneumonia. And later on, they did a scan and they found that I had blood clots that they just hadn't realized I had. And there was this one night, this night when it started to hurt every time I took a breath. And it became excruciatingly painful. It felt like every time I breathed in that my lungs were rubbing against sandpaper. And it got worse with every breath. So it got to where my body wouldn't just breathe on its own. I had to choose to take another breath. And it hurt so bad. So I started having to give myself a pep talk before every breath. Just telling myself, reminding myself, you can do this, you can do this, your kids need you, your kids are going to need you tomorrow. 
You have so much life ahead of you. You cannot give up yet. There is still a plan, a purpose for you to still be here. You have got to take another breath. And I just did it one breath at a time through the rest of that night. And I only had to do that one night, folks, one night. The next day, I got a bunch of Aleve and steroids, and I was on the road to recovery. But when I think back to how hard it was to fight through that one night, what comes to mind is so many of you, so many people I know who have to endure pain, not for just one night, but for night after night after night for weeks that turn into months that turn into years. Some of you are fighters. And I have so much respect for that. And I also have a word of encouragement for you from Paul for whatever it is that you have to fight through. That verse from chapter 1, this is why context is so important, people. The verse was to die is Christ. To die is To live is Christ, to die is gain, which sounds almost suicidal, right? Well, here's the rest of how Paul finishes that passage. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be better for me, but for your sakes, It's better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. I know you already know this because if you're here right now, you've made it so far. And if you've made it this far, then you know that there is a reason I truly believe that you need to keep going because God is going to use you for his glory right up until he calls you home. And I would, I I do, I I hate it that that you're hurting. I hate that for you. But what I would hate even more is for you to miss out on witnessing the joy that you bring into someone else's life when they realize God's goodness through you. So don't give up. Like Paul told the church in Philippi, your troubles are temporary, and God's goodness is forever. He also reminds them that they already have a direct line to the goodness of God. And so do we. Pray about everything Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Prayer absolutely changes things. Now, miracles don't always happen exactly the way we want them, exactly how we ask for them, or even in ways that we can see and recognize. That doesn't always happen. But sometimes it does. I think about my great-grandma, Winetta, that she was a praying person who prayed every day for her son, even when the doctor told her that it was a waste of time. Imagine what she thought when she saw the turn my grandpa's life took. Next. Take a look at what happened. Well, actually, I was home on my first medical leave for a Armed Forces Day parade. And I got one nice note from a senior in high school. This girl just wanted to thank me for what she believed I'd done for my country. And I said, this girl I would like to meet. So my older brother said, we'll just get all of the phone books from the area. And we'll call everybody by the name of Hall and ask if Beverly's home. We found two men that were named Beverly Hall that were irate. They hadn't written me a letter. But finally, I got a hold of her father. When she came home from work at the ice cream shop she was working in. I talked to her, and I talked her into a date, and that was in May. Four months later, Ed and Beverly got married. They have seven children. Two are orphans that they adopted. Pretty incredible. That picture from their wedding and the one that's on the screen right now, that was from a spread in Life magazine. 
My, parent, my grandparents, they for a little while went 1951 version of going viral. <laughs> Their story was covered in newspapers across the country. And you might think when you hear that, that it was happily ever after from there. I mean, they had their seven kids, privileged to be one of their 16 grandkids. I'm going to throw him off by telling you that my cousin Todd is here today, so he's another one of the 16. Lucky him. <laughs> but uh, you heard, they had seven kids, and two of them were orphans. So if you've even raised one kid, you know that it's not happily ever after. There were challenges ahead, and they had some pretty hard ones that they had to face. But the other thing that marked their lives was answered prayer. In the lives of them and their children, over and over again, God provided miracles that answered prayer. To where I, have, I am utterly convinced that God is at work and on the move in this world and that he hears us when we pray. But you know, most of those miracles that we were so grateful for growing up, those were everyday happiness miracles, where God provided those everyday things that we need to survive, those things that are temporary. You know what the real miracle is? The real miracle that happens is when we honor God as the source of all the good things. Because the actual miracle, this side of glory, that we are all really longing for, is one that Paul describes perfectly in chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. See if when you hear this, this isn't the miracle you are looking for. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing and with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. It's another one of those great quotables from the letter to the Philippians. You've probably seen it on t-shirts and mugs. I can do all things through Christ, through Christ who gives me strength. So you might be a little disappointed that Paul is not talking about helping you lift more in the gym. <laughs> this is not the key to passing a test without preparing. What Paul is talking about is living without your daily bread. Paul is talking about how through Christ, you can be content with nothing. All joy, no happiness. It's a wild thing to think about. It's the wild thing about true joy. It's, it's why most people will never experience it. Because especially in the United States, when you've got so much everyday happiness, it can seem like enough. It's getting you by. In fact, so many people only discover unquenchable joy when they run out of happiness, when it's taken away. Because only then are you confronted with the reality that you are not in control. We cannot provide for ourselves everything we need from our good God. When we get it right, though, there's this incredible promise. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. Do you see how that's a miracle? This isn't the lowered heart rate that you can get by meditating. This is not the sedation you can enjoy by having a morphine drip. This isn't something that requires us to deny this earth, leave this earth, or numb ourselves to this earth. This is what we need while we're here, while we live. Paul says, his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ. We need that. We need that peace that guards us, that protects our faith, that keeps us in joy. 
And it's not common, I can promise you that. Most people will spend their whole lives trying to fill their own cup with enough, enough happiness to get by. And they will never surrender to the God who loves them, who's always enough. But for those who do, you notice the difference. Obviously, I witnessed that in my grandparents. I love that picture. They lived for every opportunity to point people to the source of their unquenchable joy. Throughout the rest of my grandpa's life, he wanted to tell everybody about Jesus. He actually, I told you he was a government programmer in the early days, right? Well, he actually retired early from his job so that he can become a full-time missionary. Because what he had discovered is when you walk in a room with no fingers and no feet and you tell people that you know the source of unquenchable joy, they listen. And he was able to share about his faith around the world that way. And my granny, she's still, she's turning 90 September 1st. And last time I talked to her on the phone, she recently, uh, last year, she sold her house and moved into a senior living. And she was telling me about her quest to try and find some people who haven't heard about Jesus at her new place. She actually, she has a candy dish outside her door, and I'm wondering if she's trying to lure them in. <laughs> My grandparents lived to talk about their joy in the Lord. But I've also witnessed it over and over again in you, church, in people of faith. When I'm visiting them in a hospital room or a hospice room, when you're going through absolute hardship that should be knocking you flat, and you still somehow, through your grief, through your tears, have hold of hope and joy that can't be quenched. You don't even know you're doing it, but it's a light that shines in you, a light that leads the rest of us to him. This world is full of striving and temptation and tragedy hides around every corner, but we can rejoice. We can rejoice in knowing that we are his through Christ, who in this beautiful poem that Paul writes in chapter two, we learn, though he was God, he did not think equality with God was something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's stand, let's declare that, and let's rejoice that we have a good God that we can trust. Let's sing together with the worship team. <laughs>